Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Ed Steinfeld. I'm the director of the Watson Institute, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all, and my pleasure to be here for uh, our Careers in Public Policy panel, uh, Doing Well by Doing Good. I just want to quickly mention that uh, the, this event is co-sponsored by the Watson Career Lab, and um, for those of you who may be interested in our fifth year uh, MPA opportunity, um, fifth year degree program, there is information and a sign-up sheet just outside. So I uh, think events like this are really terrific uh, for a lot of reasons, but being able to speak to leading thinkers and leading actors in the public policy world and hear about what they've done and how they've done, how they've gotten to where they are, I find it very inspiring. I've always found it inspiring. I find it <coughs> inspiring from where I sit now and I think from where I sat uh, when I was a little bit younger. I found it not just inspiring, but incredibly useful. We are uh, extremely fortunate today. I'm just going to quickly uh, introduce the panel, and, and uh, we'll move forward from there. We are extremely fortunate today to have three uh, really exceptional panelists, all of whom are associated with Brown, two of whom uh, currently are part of the Watson Institute. But let me start um, really with our guest. Elizabeth Roberts is the Secretary of the Rhode Island Executive Office of Health and Human Resources and a Brown grad, Brown alumna. Yay! Uh, under her leadership, uh, Rhode Island has implemented a package of progressive, sustainable Medicaid reforms that have achieved um, well over $100 million in annual state savings, really without cutting eligibility or benefits, which is quite an exceptional achievement. Um, Elizabeth previously served as Rhode Island's first female lieutenant governor uh, and had been named by um, previous governor Lincoln Chafee in 2010 to lead the state's health care reform efforts. And since then, Rhode Island has become really a leader nationally in health care reform. Elizabeth previously served five two-year terms in the Rhode Island State Senate. Um, and as I mentioned, is a graduate of Brown and also received her MBA in healthcare management from Boston University. Uh, Elizabeth will speak first. Uh, let me just introduce the rest of the uh, really great panel. Uh, our second speaker will be uh, Brian Atwood. Brian is currently a senior fellow at uh, Watson, but Brian has had just an extraordinary professional career that's still going on. Uh, Brian, uh, in the Clinton administration, led the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, for uh, six and a half years, and had also um, served in the Clinton-Gore transition team. <coughs> he had served as uh, head of the State Department, uh, head of the transition team for the State Department in uh, 1992. Uh, Brian had also served as Under Undersecretary of State for Management prior to his uh, appointment at USAID. Brian is not just a distinguished diplomat and a distinguished, uh, very high-level policymaker, but Brian is also a um, scholar and an educator. He had served previously as Dean of the Hubert Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. That was uh, from 2002 to 2010, and he was professor of public policy and chair of the Global Studies Program at University of uh, at, at the Hubert Humphrey School. Uh, Debbie Gordon, also a Watson <laughs> senior fellow. Uh, Debbie is the director of the Energy and Climate Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and she. Um, it comes from a very interesting background, if I may say so myself. I'm a bit of an engineer wannabe. I just didn't have any of the brains necessary for it. But uh, Debbie was trained originally as a chemical engineer at the University of Colorado. Go Buffs. Uh, and she holds an MPP from the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley. Uh, Debbie works on issues of uh, global uh, oil, global oil industry, and uh, climate change. She's the author of two very important books. Uh, the first, uh, Two Billion Cars Driving Towards Sustainability, and that was from Oxford in 2009. And the second, uh, Steering a New Course, Transportation, Energy, and the Environment, and that was uh, from 1991. Uh, in pre previous uh, portions of her career, Debbie managed an energy and environmental consulting practice and taught at the uh, Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and also directed the energy policy program at the Union of Concerned Scientists. All of these individuals have 
huge CVs, which I uh, don't have the time to go into in detail, but what an <coughs> exceptional opportunity for us today to have all of you here. If I can turn it over first to you, Elizabeth, that would be great. Yeah, I'm going to set my timer so I, so I can start talking and keep going. So, um, you know, as I sit on this panel um, and think about this institute, which is really focus, focused on global and international issues, and I graduated from Brown having come here, been a uh, human bio major undergrad, and volunteered in hospitals, uh, in a hospital, women and infants, when I was a student, uh, and really loved Rhode Island and chose to stay, and have made my career right here uh, in public service. Some of it uh, in healthcare, uh, not for profit healthcare, so I think of that as public service, although we can have that discussion about how much of that is business and how much is public service these days. But then really decided to get involved politically and ran for office, served in the state legislature for 10 years, lieutenant governor for eight, which he, in this state I was able, as an independently elected lieutenant <coughs> governor, to have my own policy portfolio and a staff. Uh, and as was said in my introduction, I, um, during my second term, was asked to oversee the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, which I um, have been active working on some pieces related to that at the local level. And so now I, uh, as having moved into the executive branch as the Secretary of Health and Human Services for Governor Raimondo, I now sit in this precarious spot, and we had a New York Times reporter here yesterday talking to us about it, of kind of seeing where um, am I about to oversee the dismantling of what I have spent much of my career doing, and how, how do I protect the people that, um, so, which is about 300,000 people in Rhode Island out of a million. So when you think about health and human services, it is a huge percentage of the population for different reasons. Um, and it has been an incredibly rewarding career. Um, I've made a good enough living to live how I want to live, and I've also been able to serve the public uh, in a way that I have found really rewarding to me personally. Um, there are things to think about, and I was thinking about what it is that um, has made this rewarding for me and what the characteristics are I think about when I think about my work and uh, where different people fit into the environment that I work in. Um, so clearly mission, commitment to mission is incredibly important if you want to do work in public service because there are enormous obstacles to overcome. It's never as financially rewarding as some other choices you can make. Um, and keeping that commitment to the mission helps you get through. I'm having a particularly challenging time in my job right now, which we don't have to go through. But part of what gets me up every day and going, you know, I got to get back to work is the purpose that I'm there for, even when sometimes the work can be very frustrating. And public service can be tough and frustrating. There are a lot of obstacles you may not encounter elsewhere. I will also say that there are different pathways. So I, pa I chose a pathway kind of inside the system. You have to be, I, I cope well with incremental change. Some people are like, want to storm the barricades and blow up the system. And I love people like that because I never get anywhere if there aren't people out there doing that. But I know that what my skill set is, is not being the fighter so much as a person who sits down at the table and says, okay, what can we get done? How do we move it? Who do we bring here to help solve the problem? How do you build the team and or the coalitions, different, different purposes for different times? Um, and that's what I love doing and what I've had success doing, working with the community more, working with the people we serve, working with the people who provide service, um, and how do we improve what we do? Um, so they're advocates. So I've been kind of a government policymaker. Advocates, another pathway, incredibly valuable. If we do not have advocates speaking out, speaking up, I find myself, as I just said, I'm an incrementalist. I have spent the last two weekends protesting, um, which my children are thrilled about. Um, and so, you know, sometimes your, your roles change and you feel a call to action that's different from perhaps the one you've had before. But then I go back and I put my suit on and I go to my regular job, which is how do I, how do I get that, that next problem solved for the people that I serve? Um, there, when you think about your career, so that the other thing which sounds simple, but I will say, because it's not just the mission, but it's actually um, loving your work and the style of work that you have. So as I said, I'm somebody who likes sitting in the room and putting the people together. And I also love engaging with the people I serve. As a candidate, I loved, loved, loved knocking on doors and talking to people, hearing their stories. What did they care about? What did they want? What did they need? How could I give a face of trust to government, which people lack so much? But having that, choosing that path that fits for you, that's not a struggle, but a fit, 
is so important because then you last decades doing that and moving up. I'm not an academic. I'm sitting here next to some very um, esteemed academics. That's not my path. I chose more of a kind of out there and learn as I go path, which I have loved. But you need to find the one that fits you because that's the one where you will be successful and make a real difference. Um, and I guess the, the thing I will say is that you, you know, that sense of mission and that sense that you won't give up. That as much as um, it feels like some weeks and months and even years sometimes that things won't get better. And I'm looking at a four year period where I'm like, this could really be um, a dismantling of so much I care about across many issues. And I'm now committed to figuring out how I serve the people in this state, a million people, with a governor who doesn't agree, nor do I, how do we still serve them the way they should be served despite an administration in Washington that may not see things the way we do. So I have loved my work. I still love my work. I am way, way older than you all. I'm probably older than your parents. Um, but it has been um, a career I would recommend to anyone. And I will say, last of all, before I stop, um, I think for many people, elected office is something they think of as distasteful, nasty. Uh, both my parents, my mother said to me, uh, and I, I'm about to say something crude, my mother didn't say anything crude. She said, are you tough enough? And I said, I'm going to find out. My dad said to me, and this is, this is like my dad was like, he said, how much of a whore are you willing to be? How much will you trade off on your principles? And I said, Dad, I'm not planning on that. <laughs> I'm going to compromise. My dad was a very conservative Republican. He's no longer living. I'm going to hold my principles and myself, but work within a system where everybody doesn't agree with me. And I've been able to do that. And if you feel a call to, to elected office, please follow it, because too few people do. Um, and it's very important that we have people who really care deeply, who are willing to learn and willing to focus and willing to commit to progress to serve an elected office. And then I'll stop. Great. Thank you. Brian? Well, first of all, I have to say that uh, Rhode Island is well served, uh, Elizabeth. This is very impressive. And I, I watched your governor on uh, uh, the Jim Browdy show the other day on, on television. and. Very impressed by her as well. So Rhode Island is a very lucky state. Um, I guess the, the first thing I will tell you is an anecdote, which probably won't apply to any of you, but it's an interesting story nonetheless, um, because the theme of this is doing good by and, and doing well at the same time. <clears throat> One of my students uh, at Harvard when I was teaching there came up to me and asked if he could go to lunch with me, and um, I figured he was going to asked me to help him get a job. So I said yes. I, I'm hopefully, I'm very open to students who are, want my advice. <clears throat> so we went to lunch, and the first thing he said was, I just sold my dot-com company for $25 million. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, OK, you can pay for lunch. <clears throat> this, his name was Raj Kumar. And uh, he asked me if I would be the chair of his advisory committee. I had been the head of USAID, so he thought that might be helpful to him as he started this company called DevEx. DevEx uh, provides information to people who want to get involved in development work, and many of you may know. Uh, in fact, it's a very uh, important site for those of you who are interested in development because you can put your resume in there. and. Uh, and people look at this long list if they're interested in doing a water project in Kenya <clears throat> and uh, you, you speak Swahili, you can just press on the button and people will see your name come up if, the, if you have those qualifications. So it's a very, very good site uh, for those of you interested. My path was kind of settled for me, uh, much to my surprise, when I was selected to be a foreign exchange student. I went to the smallest country in Europe, well, arguably, Luxembourg, and was exposed to people who um, didn't live in a superpower. And I, I guess I learned then what, uh, I guess it was Teddy Roosevelt said about uh, carrying a big stick but being very silent and quiet about it all because uh, I wasn't very quiet. I was a very chauvinistic American who bragged about every Coca-Cola sign he saw. And finally, my AFS brother said, uh, you and the Soviets are just as bad. 
and I was very upset about that. And I said, how can you say that? We're a democracy, they're a communist country, et cetera. And he said, well, you both want to dominate us. That was a lesson that sort of stuck with me. I became a diplomat after that. I became a foreign service officer in the State Department. And I hope I'm very sensitive and learned a lot about intercultural learning. So the path was set, but <clears throat> the exact things that I would do later in my life, I wasn't aware of. I met a senator. When he came through Madrid, I was at the embassy and I was asked to, to take care of him. <clears throat> so we spent three days together and he was 38 years old. He was uh, elected on the basis of his opposition to the Vietnam War. And we hit it off and later went to work for him, <clears throat> had to leave the Foreign Service. <clears throat> and five years later, uh, when uh, Jimmy Carter was elected, I was asked to go down to the State Department as a Deputy Assistant Secretary. And two years after that, at the age of 30, I was an Assistant Secretary of State, which is a presidential position, one of the youngest uh, to have that happen. So uh, you never know. And I guess my message to people who are looking uh, for a career in public service, first of all, it is a, it is a great career. It's very exciting. Elizabeth, as you were speaking, I was thinking of one, one thing in my life that I've always thought about. If you don't wake up in the middle of the night more than four or five times a week thinking about some idea that you've had or some problem that you've do, you're not really, you don't have a very good job. It's not very exciting. <laughs> you really have to have a job that keeps you on your toes in, in that regard. Um, so, you know, the one thing that certainly happened to me was uh, that I had a great deal of luck meeting this senator and then becoming, you know, going beyond the career ladder. I mean, this is another, I guess, message for you. In public service, you can decide to go into a career position, and there's an awful lot of negative things that are said about bureaucrats. I have a great deal of respect for them. My son is one, um, and they do a, a very good job, and they work hard. Uh, but you make a decision that you're in a on a career ladder and you decide whether or not, in my case, uh, I had to decide whether I wanted to wait until I was 50 years old to become an ambassador. <clears throat> I really was a little more impatient than that. I didn't think I would have to wait that long. So I left and I took a chance. Um, I became a political appointee and I knew that that was, uh, I was uh, destined to leave office one day. And of course, Jimmy Carter wasn't uh, reelected. So I went into the hinterlands. I eventually ended up with the best job I've ever had, which was to run the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs, which is the uh, loosely affiliated with the Democratic Party. Now it's chaired by Madeleine Albright uh, had been chaired by Walter Mondale when I was the president of NDI. And basically, it promotes democracy and human rights around the world. So there is a non-governmental organization which has a lot of funding from the U.S. government. It, again, another uh, possibility uh, if you're not interested in going into a career, a professional career. You can think about, as Elizabeth suggested, I, I would think today more than ever we need people who are effective advocates. And to be an effective advocate, it seems to me you need a graduate degree. Um, that might not have been necessary in my day, but it's certainly absolutely essential today. And when you get a graduate degree in public policy, you're going to learn uh, a great deal about analysis about what empirical data means. You're going to <clears throat> learn statistics, something that may bore you, but uh, uh, it's absolutely essential that you have the grounding to be able to take a public policy issue, look at it from the point of view of several academic disciplines, and come up with uh, the right ideas. Uh, and it, it's never been more important <clears throat> than it is today. I don't think I have to tell you why, um, because there are some people who are in very high positions today that don't seem to know how to read <laughs> uh, or are not serious enough to look uh, in depth at, at some of the issues that we're facing. Uh, when I was asked to lead the State Department transition, 
I don't think I've ever been more excited uh, coming back into government after the Carter administration uh, to lead the transition during the Clinton years. <clears throat> Met a number of people, including professional foreign service officers. You may have seen uh, in recent days that uh, over a thousand of them have now signed a, a, a dissent channel message. That dissent channel was created <clears throat> during my initial uh, exposure to the State Department when I think over 500 signed uh, something that opposed the Vietnam War, <clears throat> basically saying it was a mistake. Well, they had no way to handle sort of, if you will, whistleblowers within the State Department, and that's when the dissent channel was created. Now they actually give awards for the best dissent channel messages within state. I'm not sure how this administration is going to handle this uh, large <clears throat> number of people who signed this message, but it's going to be very interesting. Um, but I, I remember talking to people, and I guess this is my final message, uh, who came to me as the transition leader and as professional foreign service officers said, you know, I've always opposed the last administration's policies. I'm really a Democrat <clears throat> and I really want a job as the underlying message in this next administration. I didn't respect that. Uh, they, they weren't acting as professionals. And of course, that's something that if you do become a foreign service officer, you're there to serve. That doesn't mean that your voice shouldn't be heard. If you're in opposition to a policy, you should state it within the bounds of your job. You should sign dissent channel messages if you feel that way about the policy, feel strongly. Or in the case of a, <clears throat> a man by the name of John Brady Kiesling, whose book, uh, I've got a chapter from his book that I use in my class, who resigned in conscience because of his opposition to the Iraq War. So all of these things are considerations for wherever you are. You're abs Elizabeth is absolutely right that you really have to feel enjoyment in any job that you have. And it seems to me that you can choose a number of things in terms of your graduate education. I always thought about academic <clears throat> pro professionalism. Uh, it, there are three basic strands to getting a professional academic graduate degree. One is go to a business school, another is to go to a law school, another is to go to a public policy school. Um, I have always argued that the best deal is to go to a public policy school. Uh, you can, it's a little cheaper than the others. Uh, nowadays there is a surplus of lawyers <coughs> out there. Uh, and business degrees cost a lot more than a public policy degree. But more importantly, you know, you can go, uh, you know, I was once considered, didn't get it, but to, to be the dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and, and they were deciding to inject some business um, uh, concepts into their degree program. Uh, they did do that, and, and, but any public policy degree that's worth its salt does have a, a, gives you enough background so that you can work in business as well as in government or in, non -go in the non-governmental fields. So all of these are considerations. If you're interested in development work, I uh, just spoke last week to the Society for International Development. It's a, it's, it's a very, they are basically uh, uh, advising uh, students or people who are looking for jobs in the field. And so that's uh, another possibility for you. I mean, another public service position, of course, is academia, and it's an ex extraordinarily important thing. And there, I think, you have to go all the way and get your PhD if you really want to be involved in academia. So I'll stop there. Um, I've had a checkered career, and uh, if you looked at it, you would say there's no pattern to it. And when I have students come to me and say, I'm going to do this, 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 and this, and they've got their whole the next two decades all lined up for themselves, they're making a big mistake. You have to have a degree of fatalism uh, to be thinking about these things. You're not always going to get what you want. And I mean, I've been rejected. I just mentioned being rejected as the dean of the Fletcher School, but the next thing that happened was that I got to be the dean of the Humphrey School. That was a much better fit for me. So be fatalistic, be ambitious, be optimistic, uh, but understand that you're going to um, 
you know, you're going to find opportunities wherever you end up. Great. I'll Thank stop you. there. Thank you. Debbie. Yeah, I mean, I think I can tie these strands together a little bit by saying how much I, too, very different um, pathways have loved my career trajectory, which is, also has been a patchwork of many different um, stages and, and places. What I think I've loved most about my career that only the public policy would have allowed me this, not the chemical engineering, which I'll tie in in a second, has that I've been able to work in every different sector. And I think that when you see the world from the public and the private and the nonprofit, the academic sector, you've kind of circled around what life's all about, you know, all the different places where you can give back, where you can learn, where you become purposeful. And you have these really long, varied careers that are, are great. I personally always loved math and science, and I knew when I was young I would never go into medicine. <laughs> so I had to find this early career path for myself where I found um, chemical engineering very similar to this time that we're in now, because when I went to undergrad, it was 1979 to 1982, and it ended up being um, the time of the second oil crisis. So it was this very similar roller coaster time in the energy sphere, where while I was in school, prices were high and things were crazy like they were a couple of years ago, and then the market fell out from underneath of it. Um, I took a job with Chevron, and it was fascinating. I learned how a major oil company thinks, especially in times of boom and bust, which is similar to now. And I did a lot of environmental permitting for them and thought how they thought, but I was restless, and I really wanted to think much more broadly. So I think that would be the first lesson I would say to you, and it echoes what Brian said, don't ever feel you're stuck. You know, you go someplace, and it's the first, you know, a place that you go, you decide what you're doing, and then you always have the opportunity to kind of transform yourself. Education is the great way to do that. So I stepped back after my five years at Chevron, and I said, I think a public policy degree is in order. It just seemed like after listening, I didn't have the benefit of sitting in a room like this with you to figure it out. I was thinking industrial psychology. I was all over the place. Public policy was still relatively new, coming out of the 70s. And... I went back to school at Berkeley, and I met Eric Potashnik, who I'm married to. Um, it was one of the best things I ever did in my life, not only meeting my husband, but also really thinking back to our class of, of students that we had around us. No one was wedded to any one thing. I mean, we had folks that were working in labor policy. We had child policy. We had health policy and, and public health. There were about three or four other engineers in our class. And I love the idea that we all had a mission in mind, which was to try to make the world a, a somewhat of a better place, but from all these different perspectives. It was this melting pot of different interests. And you learn so much, not just from the professors, but from your class, which I thought was, was fantastic. I left there, and I knew that I wanted to not go back into the private sector, at least right away. So I joined the Union of Concerned Scientists, and I, I opened an office for them in California. I worked on transportation policy for many years. I worked in Congress. I worked at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab at a time. I think that the tether in all of that part of my life post public policy degree was being a policy entrepreneur. And, and it, we heard it here, you know, from both of these folks as well, the idea that you have ideas of these solutions to problems. When I was 20, sitting in your, you know, in your seats, I thought that the world was a, I mean, I think I appreciated the complexities in the world, but I thought that problems were pretty easily solved. And now, all these years later, I realize it doesn't take me off my mission to solve it, but I realize how hard it is to solve problems. Probably the world's problems are best solved by a sum of 2% solutions, where you have to keep at it. And I think that's what motivates me to keep at it. Um, when we were having kids, what I loved about my policy degree, and this speaks to both you know, male and female, it was really a flexible career. So I consulted <laughs> for 15 years when my kids were growing up, because there were always policy projects to work on. And once I was doing energy and environment, it was a broad enough issue, just as health is, and in different spheres, you can use your skills to actually consult to others so you can take these hiatuses in your career without leaving your career, which was fantastic for me because I could juggle family and, and my intellectual curiosity in my life. And that was the bridge to me joining the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in 2010. And what I love about the think tank world, I think it's probably also true in the academic sphere, is you are truly free to step back, not for any one client, 
but for you know whatever your your mind's causes to decide what what are the problems and what are the solutions and now you're really in a place of policy entrepreneurship so um, just to give you a flavor, uh, about four years ago, I had been working on transportation policy, cars and trucks and air pollution, for many, many years. That's where I took my policy career. And when this oil and gas revolution started with fracked oil and oil sands and oil changing, I realized that the early part of my career at Chevron was a lot like the world now, even though there was 25 years in between. And so I worked with colleagues at Stanford and the University of Calgary to develop an oil climate index that assesses global oils in terms of their greenhouse gas emissions and compares them. So I was able to kind of go back to the future in my own career where I started out and bring that information, that knowledge, because of policy, back to current affairs in the world right now, which I just think is fantastic. And then a second example I'll, I'll give you on how you can kind of be circular and organic if you do go the policy route, which I think keeps you young in terms of your career, as you heard here, or the excitement you know that stays with you in a career, which is not always common. Um, but I was approached, I first approached and then um, he came back to me, one of my early mentors at Chevron. So I have this whole group of people that I entered the oil industry with that stayed their entire career. I wasn't one of them, they've just retired. So a lot of my early friends in my career at 21 and 22 years old, they've now concluded their careers. They had their 30 years, they retired. They're young, but they're retired. So I approached one of my first friends, mentors at Chevron, and I said, you know, I think we should start something called the National Environmental Legacy Project. I don't know if we'll stick with the name, but I like it. And it is to take the people that went through industry post Earth Day, like in that environmental movement with the environmental in, in, as the core of who they were, and actually take the lessons they learned and bring that legacy back to today. So we can reinvigorate and re-energize industry and this partnership, this, this collaboration that always has taken place between industry and the NGO sector to hopefully make everything work to, to see this, this um, you know, see progress as on both ends, both the private and the public side, because I think it is a marriage between the two. And now he, Steve, has assembled all of these other retired engineers. I have someone who's retired for Sandia National Lab. We're starting to like knit this new group together of people that want to give back. So I think that, you know, just again, to echo what was said here, I think if you do choose to go into public policy, you're going to have a very long, and fruitful and exciting career ahead of you. I don't know what your career will be if you go other routes, but I will say I almost can promise you if you are, and if you get excited about ideas, if you think creatively about problems, if you're motivated to find different solutions, if you don't run out of steam and you're the, well, you're here, so you're the type of people that, that get excited about this, you will love a public policy career and it will just open your world for you and you'll find yourself toward the end of your career get being just as excited as you were in the beginning. Thank you, Debbie, and thank you to the whole panel. That's great. We have time for questions. Questions from the book? See your hands up. Yep. So you had one piece of advice to give to someone looking for like first jobs in public policy. Like where should we start looking? Like what's you know what's the I don't know, do you have any thoughts on like entering? Well, uh, Go ahead. I was just going to say, I think a lot of it comes from, and, and I guess my, my path speaks this a little bit, but I think having some sort of substantive interest and knowledge that marries to this broader policy, you know, the goals of problems and solutions and crafting policy um, prescription. I would say start with what that substance is in your core. I don't know what your, what are you, what, what's your background interest? I think research and migration and homelessness. I've been focused on so far. But I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I do think, honestly, it's a time of real reinvigoration at the local and state level. So I would say, I'm, I work in Washington, and I'd say not necessarily running to Washington right now might be a good thing. Um, but I do think at the local and state level, there's a purpose and a, um, a need. 
So I want to I want to capitalize on something that Ed said. A, the political doorway is a is a quick escalator sometimes. So if you uh, even on a volunteer basis, but on a paid basis in some way, get involved in an effort through either most likely a person, you know, that you're trying to help, you can find your way fairly quickly. I'm about to interview a woman who's 32 and has been a deputy secretary in Washington because she found her way in the door. Um, and, you know, so, and that's about being smart and hardworking and lucky. <coughs> so luck is the other I want to emphasize. But, um, you know, and then the other, the other way is to have a skill that's needed um, in an area you care about. So I've got a, my son right now is working for an organization that is not um, is local, the Institute for the Study and Practice of Nonviolence, and that's not his area of expertise. But he's creating a data kind of program assessment for them, which they didn't have any of that skill. They, you know, they, so finding a, a niche where you can help advance an area. Um, that they may have, an organization may have the mission you're thinking about. So when you think about homelessness, there's so many. But then they're lacking in some of the capacities they need to take themselves to the next level. So, um, you know, there's opportunities there that then you can find your way. But in, in, if in some of the quick movement, it's really about connecting yourself to somebody who politically is moving whether it's locally or nationally. There are a, a stunning number of people working for Governor Raimondo right now between 25 and 30 years old, mm -hmm. a whole bunch of them. And um, it's great. I, so, and, and so let me tell you the other side. So for somebody like me, who's in my late 50s, I love working with a whole bunch of 25 and 30 year olds because they got educated in a different way. They think about the world differently than I do, even though I try and keep up. And it's an exciting thing. So, you know, it's. Just keep looking, but particularly if you have that area, try and find the, what you can offer them that they don't have yet. The only thing I would add, and I certainly agree to that, the last point, because that's what happened to me. I hooked on to a U.S. senator, and that, that uh, changed my life and career. But uh, internships are extraordinarily important. Now, the negative side is that there are a lot of organizations that are really exploiting interns, aren't paying them and, and the rest. So if you can do your internship, you know, to get college credit or as part of your, your academic experience, that's great. But choose wisely the, the, the organization because many interns that, that um, work, especially in Washington, which I know best, uh, really catch on that way and um, make the contacts. Networking is extraordinarily important. Unfortunately, you know, you're all talented in this room. If you're Brown students, you're talented, but it depends on who you know in the end. So uh, internships are important. Great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm a senior now at Brown in public policy and thinking about post Brown and careers. And I definitely see kind of like a cliff coming, like there's a date I graduate, and then after that date I need to have something or not. Uh, and it's a little daunting. Um, and you each talked about a lot of different career moves. I imagine in my life, unlike my grandparents, I will not be working at the same place for 25 years. Um, and you talked about some fatalism and being willing to, you know, go for it. So my question is, how did you know when the time was the right time to move from one thing to the next? How did you deal? I mean, it's like, I don't even have my first job. It's like a scary thing. Like, how am I going to pay bills? Like, where am I going to work? Like, just like leaving a job is not a small issue. Mm. You know, I think it's instinct to some extent. Uh, you know, one thing that to always think about is that are you going to be, um, are you just changing jobs to change jobs? Or are you going to go up another level and learn, have an opportunity to learn even more? Uh, so that's an important consideration. Uh, many, many of the, the students that I've had uh, as graduate students uh, are in the same situation. I do think you need your, that credential nowadays. And, um, and I must say, I've put a pitch in for the Watson Institute and the Taubman Center. We've, we've got an up a tremendous opportunity there to get a graduate degree in, in one year, and I think that's a very important credential to have. You have to think about the person who has an opening. 
say, the National Democratic Institute, where I worked for a while, um, you know, you, you advertise the opening and you'll get uh, 100 resumes. Uh, if it's very easy to simply say, we don't have a master's degree, just put that aside. Um, unless, of course, you've been an intern, maybe you'll have an opportunity, they'll know you. Uh, anything that can, can really uh, sell, you know, what you have to offer is important. But the credential, unfortunately, today is, is just absolutely essential uh, because it's too easy to set aside someone who doesn't have an advanced degree. I mean, I would add, I'm just going through resumes now. Carnegie has a junior fellow program, and it's too late because you're a senior. But I think what I would say, and maybe you've done this already, what I would say to anyone who still has some semesters left as an undergrad would be take, definitely take economics <laughs> um, and take enough analytic classes and enough breadth in your curriculum. Because as I go through things, I see a lot of students that have devoted themselves to their major, maybe a double major, but it's narrow. And I think the world is a very broad place right now. You need to be able to think across many different spheres at once. Um, and I would echo what Elizabeth said. I think that if you have, for the first question, if you have an idea, um, either something that's data-driven, something that's knowledge-driven, I'd say do it. Like, do it in your spare time. That's a little bit of the juice that goes with public policy anyway. Like, you never really get bored of yourself. You're always working on something. And if that means, you know, taking the initiative to write an article that you submit somewhere or to build a database that you share. But I would just say endeavor. And there is a lot of luck involved in this, but I've found that there's a lot of just personal self-interest of perpetuating your thought that goes into this. My moves were really, to answer your direct question, my moves were really um, much more motivated by my husband's career. So when Eric was moving, I was getting creative and moving as well. But I have somewhat bought into, and it always, I always landed and felt great about it, but I've kind of subscribed to a basic thought was wherever you are in life, try to get out at the top. Don't ride the elevator to the bottom. You know, it's really important in life to kind of be aware of you and the world and your situation and your own interests and your own life and then try to try to stay where you are and have a great ride at it and then if it lasts for a very long time, great. And if not, don't let it bring you down to a point where you feel lost in where you are. So I'm going to, I have not had a particularly linear career. I kind of left out the first 15 years of my career and my, I didn't even run for office until I was almost 40. Um, but I will say something Ed said, and that is kind of instinct. There were times when there was an opportunity, and I was like, it's not quite what I thought I was going to do, but it really, for some reason, interested me. The people I would be working with, and I can't, um, that is incredibly important. I always wanted to learn. I wanted to work with people I could learn from. Um, that sometimes I go, you know, I'm just going to try it. And so those are some of the best choices I ever made, because I didn't, I didn't really have a path I'd already mapped for myself. As opportunities came along, I took them. I will also be honest and tell you that my first nine months out of Brown, I worked at a store on Wickenden Street. Okay? I, was, I wanted to stay here. I didn't have a career path job yet. Uh, I ended up at Pawtucket Memorial Hospital after that. But I was like, I'm staying here. I'm going to figure it out. And I took a job at a store on Wickenden Street. And I also, it gave me a moment to decompress and think about what I wanted to do. Um, and so, you know, people have different pathways. I went to graduate school at night because I needed to work while I went to grad school, which is why I went to BU because I could do that. So, you know, you find that path and some of it is what you'll, I think often you can have a natural sense of what's the right step for you and you should listen to that. You know, think about it. If you tend to have, make bad choices, maybe don't listen to it. But, you know, you will, there will be something and you go, hmm, I thought I was going there, but that looks really interesting. I would never, when I was 22, I would never in a million years have told you that I would have been somebody who is a politician. Never. I grew up with the Watergate kids. I watched the destruction of politics. And I would never have done that. At 39, somebody said, you want to run for office? And I went, you know what? I would love to do that. And it was the best thing I ever did. So, you know, listen to that voice sometimes, especially if you have the ability to do it. Because um, it can be some of the most rewarding choices that you make. Other question? Yeah. Hi. Um, so I have a question uh, for Elizabeth. Kind of just like to respond to Deborah's point about getting out on top. Um, 
So working in an administration. I'm sliding at the yeah, moment. I'm just <laughs> saying. But go ahead. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm considering a career with State Department as well, and mm. now have to reconsider whether I do want to work in an administration that I don't align with. So to what extent is that contradictory? Like, how should you follow your passions versus like knowing that it might not be the best move from like upward mobility standpoint? Well, hmm, good question. Yes, everyone. Yeah, no, I mean, so I will be honest and say that I made several choices that probably weren't the best move from an upward mobility perspective, but then because I was able to turn them into that, they did become that, right? So um, don't underestimate the value of luck, but also hard work. You'll be surprised when you get out there in the big world. A lot of people actually don't work that hard. If you're willing to work hard, you can accomplish a lot. And I discovered in politics, there's a lot of people who don't work hard. And I love, I love complicated public policy. And there's legislatures are not full of people who love that. So I was able to be really successful because I would work really hard on figuring out how we wanted to do whatever it was in health insurance regulation, you know, kind of stuff most people eyes glaze over. The, so the other thing that I I want to mention to you when you say, you know, I'm interested in in foreign service, but thinking about this administration and how could I possibly do that. So I, I have been in political environments that I was uncomfortable in. Um, and I actually always felt I worked for the public, not for the government. Um, and it was my job to make my part of government the best it could be. You know, I, I was in some leadership structures in the legislature where I was like, hmm, you know, I ended up in the back of the state police because a guy that I worked for ended up arrested and going to jail. I never knew that it was a, not a comfortable thing, but the work I did on that committee was actually very good. So, you know, it's, you've got to figure out how you manage yourself and what you're comfortable and can, can do. Um, and, but, but I'd encourage you, especially in this environment right now, which is a worldwide, I think not just an American phenomenon, um, if we don't have people who disagree in positions of authority and power, then it only gets worse. And the times I wanted to quit my elected job, I would have enough of an ego. I would go home at the end of the legislative session. I would say, I'm not running again. It's done. I'm done. I don't want to have to compromise about some things. And then I would sit there and I'd go, but if I leave, does somebody better come in? Who's going to speak up on the issues I care about? Who's going to fight for those things? And um, can I also say something that's politically incorrect? It's OK to have an ego. <laughs> it's OK to believe that you offer something valuable and therefore to commit to providing that to the broader community. Because that's really a lot of what public service is about. And I should clarify what I said, because I don't think you can get out at the top unless you're in. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> so I think the best time to get into a job is in a time of chaos. It's not yep. easier, <laughs> but you will learn so much. So I would definitely go if you were inclined to and not avoid going because of what you read is going on. I came into the oil industry during a time of crisis. I learned so much. I started the Union of Concerned Scientists when climate change became a thing. I learned so much. I think the best time to go in is just at this time. And you will know if you feel the time comes, this isn't the right way to go. And then you get out at the top because you're already in there. And I wouldn't worry as a junior foreign service officer that you're going to have to spend your days defending the Trump administration's foreign <laughs> policy. Really, I mean, I was in during the Vietnam War, um, and I was assigned to the Ivory Coast uh, in West Africa, Cote d'Ivoire. And all sorts of things that an embassy does on a day-to-day -day basis, and consular officer, you know, various things. even. The political officers at, the, at that embassy didn't have to defend the Vietnam War. That wasn't their, their thing. And there are many ways to rationalize if you disagree with the policy. Um, your basic position as a diplomat is to say, this is what they are saying back in Washington. That's not necessarily what you're saying. There are, if, you're act, if you act as a professional, you can do it. Now, if you were to get into the Foreign Service this year, it would probably take them six months to get a security clearance. Then you'd go through training. Then they'd send you to language training. By that time, Trump will be the pa in the past. <laughs> <laughs> qu yes. So I'm considering concentrating in computer science. And
and I'm kind of interested in the policy applications of oh, that. Um, I'm kind of realizing the skill set, though, to build a product versus um, be helpful to policy is very different. So, like, what kind of skills and interests do um, does policy need from technical people? I think it's just your very way of thinking. You know, having, and not everyone in policy has to be technical, but I've found that, for my mind, the people that I love, love solving problems with and working with are the people that come to a problem analytically, and that's your brain. So I'd say your skill set in the 21st century with computer science a very or a very technical background for anyone else is probably, it's vital. <laughs> it's more than important. Not that everyone shouldn't consider it from their social, other important perspectives, but there aren't enough people, I think, that are technically trained and minded that go in. So I would say the world's your oyster if you end up going with computer science and public policy. And I will say that certainly in government now, one of the things, all of a sudden a light bulb went on and people went, well, we're spending a lot of money and we don't really know how much of it makes that much of a difference uh, in a positive or a negative way. Um, so there is a whole strand of careers now around helping to develop data, analytic tools to help us understand the impact of programs and investments that we make. And it is a very valuable commodity because it is lacking in government and very necessary. So there are enormous opportunities. And I think it's also true that we haven't even quite figured out how to do it yet. So to not only have somebody with a technical expertise, but a way of thinking differently and more analytically about the work we do is really, really valuable. I actually just want to add, I wasn't kidding when I said I'm an engineer wannabe. Uh, I really do believe that increasingly the overlap between technical discipline, computer science, engineering, and public policy, that overlap is just getting more obvious in many ways and in lots of different areas. But just think about cyber. So yes, of course, cyber security. But where is industrial innovation today primarily? It's not happening in the making of physical products necessarily, but all the data-centric activities surrounding them. And even in governance itself, using data analytics. to so. I would just say um, do it, and moving down a computer science or, or science and engineering path doesn't preclude public policy and, in fact, may create all kinds of opportunities. And just the last self-serving collectively <laughs> plug I would make is Brown is a good place to do that. I mean, the boundaries between the sciences and engineering and the social sciences, Watson, the boundaries, to the extent they exist, are really porous and flexible. It's a great place to, to be. Mm -hmm. Comments? Questions? I just had one last maybe question for the, the panel, and you, you touched on this a little bit, but um, I think for most people earlier, early in their careers, except for some very lucky folks, but early in their careers, they do kind of crappy work. They don't do bad, they do really great work, but the jobs they get are often not as romantic as we'd like, and a lot of us when we think about what do we want to do, we think about, you know, it's more toward the middle, the end of the career, the very romantic kinds of jobs. So if maybe when you started out or if you think about how you saw others start out, when you're doing an entry-level job that's not really your dream, how do you use that opportunity? You know, how do you network or how do you create, how do you create opportunities from the starting point rather than the more romantic side of things? I think you listen and you learn and you take every opportunity. I mean, if you're, uh, if, for example, an intern working in an office for someone who's who does a lot of writing, um, he'll probably ask you to go off and Xerox something for him, uh, copy something for him. But you have an opportunity also just to, on your own to write a memo to him, say, I've had this idea or that idea. I mean, you, you can ex show what talents you have and, 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 and give some thought to that. I mean, it, it, people who are good mentors will encourage that kind of activity when you're young. And it's, there's an old saying that youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Don't I waste it. it's all of the attitude, really. I mean, I think about some of my jobs. Okay, I'll tell you the one that helped me get my job at Chevron. I was a group leader at summer camp for 37, 13-year-old girls. And the fellow hiring me said, I've got a 13-year-old, and if you can handle 37 of them, you could do anything. <laughs> and it had nothing to do with the job. I was also aroused about for an oil company in Louisiana, which taught me so much about that part of the world. And I was digging ditches and cutting carbon out of compressors and doing crazy things that were not necessarily fun, but it was fun. So I think a lot of it is this yes, 
like this attitude that these are all building blocks and you start to assemble what you've learned and you say yes way more than you say no and you kind of find pleasure <coughs> in the mundane and the things that you do and then all of a sudden it kind of builds who you are and it becomes part of the formulation of how you solve problems. Okay. Yeah, and so I my my first kind of mundane job was also one I wasn't really qualified for. I was an office manager, which is not my skill set. As a, I've got a staff member back here who will probably nod at that. <laughs> I'm a good thinker. I'm not always a good manager and organizer. But um, but interestingly, so I but I worked really hard and I was there early and I stayed late and I did whatever needed to get done. And then somebody from another area who had a job much more suited to my skills, which is to do uh, clinical research. Um, came in and said, we want to hire you to come over and do clinical research. So I'm within the same organization, but because they're kind of watching me do what I do, which wasn't particularly interesting, they're like, whoa, but uh, we can use that person to do a different job here in the same organization. So, um, and I have to say, sometimes those jobs can be, you know, you usually have another, a group of people who are doing those jobs. It's, it's not always, it may seem mundane, but it's also a way to build the team. And often members of this team move up in their organization kind of alongside you. Um, and those will be people that you, it's like your roommates, you know. They're the people that you know as you move forward and build your network. So, I don't know. I, um, I look back fondly on some of my less than exciting jobs of the past. I love being a waitress, for example. You know, I had that moment. Um, so you I learn, was a you supermarket learn. checker out. Right. I love so that the other thing too. is to realize that in the most mundane job, you learn things. Yeah. Absolutely learn things that will serve you. I learned things as a waitress that serve me well now. Right. Um, but even in my first entry level career job, um, you know, I learned skills. I learned um, some new data analytics skills that I didn't have. I learned, new, you know, you just take advantage to learn because that learning will carry through for you. Great. Any final questions? Can I just make one yeah, final please, piece of advice? Um, be ambitious. Um, but wherever you are, do the best possible job you can do, whether it's mundane or not. Because so many people, and I've had people when I was uh, Assistant Secretary of State who kept looking for the next best job and they, they didn't do the job they were in. That's really, that's a big fault of a lot of people. They're so ambitious that they, they show it. Be ambitious but don't show it. Do the best possible job you can wherever you are. And if you are working for the right people, they'll reward you, don't worry. So, and, uh, so this is for giving advice. So here's mine, enjoy your work. And if you don't enjoy your job, find a different job. The one job I didn't like it actually impacted my whole life, and I realized I need to like change jobs, and I did, and things were better. Enjoy your work, because then it's not work. It's your life. And if you don't like your job, it, it's just tough to get up and want to go and make a difference. Mm -hmm. So um, enjoy it. It's, it's a big part of your life, so you should enjoy it. Fantastic, Absolutely. and on, on that note, let's all thank Elizabeth Roberts, <laughs> Debbie Gordon, and Brian Atwood.